So what, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, pretty much the, the state of, a of, of, of advancement of a project we have started two years ago with the ERC Realit project. So you, you will not see firm conclusions from this project. It's, it's meant to uh, last for five years. So it's only two years, so you'll see some results, but not the, the final conclusion. So it's pretty much uh, some work in, in progress. Uh, so the project motivation first. Uh, without strain localization, there, there wouldn't be, of course, plate tectonics, okay? Uh, but we, we don't really know how plate form in the past or how they continue to form nowadays when we have uh, plate uh, fragmentation, for instance. The, uh, separation of Arabia from Africa, uh, for instance. And this question goes back uh, to 1924, for instance, when, when Argon uh, just noticed that uh, the place of the present Atlantic Ocean there must have been an older ocean, which uh, led uh, afterward to the formation of the Caledonites. And that was the first time that someone proposed that uh, continental drift could have happened several times, which was not uh, in the early uh, uh, Wegener's model. Okay. So that was, uh, wh why do two oceans form at the same place is one, one major question. Okay. Uh, much more recently, um, there was uh, this paper by Berkovici and, and, and Ricard uh, using uh, something that is very well known in, by uh, experimental uh, uh, people dealing with uh, lab experiments with uh, squeezing rocks or field geologists that uh, strain localization is always associated with uh, grain size reduction. And um, combining large scale pressure gradients uh, in a convecting mantle and grain size evolution during deformation in this paper uh, they, they succeed in, in somehow in, in forming uh, new plates uh, at the surface of the, of the Earth. Another important question is that uh, based on field observation, either long-term field observation like classical geology or uh, ge space geodesy, for instance, that there is no real consensus on the rheology of large scale, the rheology of at large scale of continental plates. Okay. And, uh, you, you may, uh, it's working, it's uh, of course you remember this debate between the tenants of a very rigid continental lithosphere even below Tibet and others uh, claiming that this lithosphere is, is very soft. Okay. And this debate is not entirely closed. Uh, if, we, if we come to a different place like the Aegean, which I, I like uh, so much that I was there yesterday, um, we see that localization processes are active at very different space and time scales. Okay. Uh, we have uh, this continuous, sub continuous subduction since uh, 70 million years here in, in, in that area at least. We have had extension distributed over um, a vast region here since approximately 35 MA. Uh, we have uh, one or several large detachment faults here, or shear zone, that uh, have accommodated part of this extension. And uh, we have one very large scale fault that has migrated here since approximately 10 million years from east to west here. Long strongly localized, progressive localization of deformation. And um, we also have uh, uh, the propagation of the earthquakes, the large earthquakes along the North and Azalean Fault uh, during the 20th century. So very different time scales, very different space scales uh, are involved in the deformation of uh, continental lithosphere. So what about mantle versus crust in terms of, uh, from the viewpoint of a geologist? Uh, well, there was this debate here, uh, very, very active and sometimes uh, uh, aggressive here, uh, about the, the difference between the creme brulee type uh, rheology and the jelly sandwich type rheology, rheology. and it, it, it seems that in some places the, uh, uh, the uh, jelly sandwich is, uh, is more efficient and in, in some areas of the world the creme brulee is more, is more efficient. Uh, but what comes out is that uh, the, the mantle has to be in many places resistant, and, but however it is, it is very often aseismic. And there was a nice paper published recently by Fred Guédon uh, here that uh, 
summarizes very well this question, and uh, he has done uh, uh, clever modeling and, and using different causes of strain weakening either in the crust or in the mantle. And those different causes of strain weakening in, in the crust, it's mostly uh, forming new weak mineral phases during deformation because of metamorphism, because of interaction with fluids. And in the mantle, activation of, for instance, low temperature uh, uh, deformation mechanism like grain boundary sliding. And this leads to a uh, strain weakening that is very efficient in the upper crust and the mid crust and in the uh, upper part of the subcontinental mantle. And so he comes up with this uh, scheme here where at low strain uh, rate and low strain, you have uh, a resistant mantle here. And at high, high strain rate and high strain, you got a, a mantle that is uh, not resistant here. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, you go from this that would look like a, a sort of jelly sandwich type model to uh, a more, uh, a model that is closer to a, a creme brulee type model. And it's uh, weak plate boundaries, uh, even though the starting material was, uh, was strong, especially the mantle. So let's turn our attention to continental crust. So continental crust compared to the mantle, as far as we can say, because we very rarely see the mantle. Uh, the continental crust is highly heterogeneous, it's hydrated, and it's prone to metamorphic recrystallization that form weak phases. Let's take a few, a few examples here. My favorite, uh, favorite detachment system here, the North Icladic detachment system that runs from here all the way to Turkey, here that's big, uh, top to the North detachment system here. It's very well expressed in the field here, for instance, on the island of Mykonos, you have the, the tilted blocks in the sediments, Miocene sediments and the detachment below. Uh, on the island of Tinos, you have this very distinct fault here that separates an upper plate without any high pressure metamorphism and a lower plate with some high pressure metamorphism. And uh, you see a progressive localization of strain along this boundary with first asymmetric fold here and, and then shear bands and, and then the fault itself that comes uh, in the system. And within this system that works from, say, 25 kilometers deep to up all the way to, to the surface, uh, very early in the history, uh, it was invaded by meteoric fluids. And those fluids, they, are, they have uh, uh, led to the crystallization of veins that can be uh, very big. And the study of those veins showed that the fluids come from the surface. So if we have a story like this one where the detachment here is invaded by fluids coming from the surface and reaching the brittle ductile transition here and promoting uh, strain localization. Another example that was, we studied some time ago is uh, Alpine Corsica here. And we have this contact, big contact here between the Alpine units with high pressure metamorphism and here the continental unit with also high pressure metamorphism. And this contact is a major thrust that has been reactivated as a detachment zone in, in the tertiary. And Fred, Fred Guedon, always the same Fred Guedon, uh, a few years ago also uh, put forward a model where uh, strain localization in, is enhanced by this reaction here, the transformation of feldspar in the, in the granitic part of the of, the, of, of the, uh, the geology of the area uh, into, into mica. So you start with uh, resistant minerals and you end up with less resistant mineral. And this leads to a weakening of the, uh, of the material here with the, uh, uh, the flow loss of the myelon myel resulting myelonite here is here when that of feldspar or the protolith is here. And, and, and you end up with the formation of shear zones at the depth of the brittle ductile transition. And these are some of the images he produced at that time with those shallow dipping uh, extensional shear zone at the depth of the uh, brittle ductile transition. And once you have created those shear zones uh, in, the, in, the, in the crust, so due partly to uh, metamorphic recrystallization and interaction with fluid, you have some heterogeneity in the, in the crust here and you can reactivate this heterogeneity with brittle processes. And you can make uh, shallow dipping, low angle, normal faults, even in a brittle regime. Okay. 
So we have this complex interaction between uh, fluids and, and, and rocks uh, that can lead to strain localization. We've seen different scales of the problems. So um, that was partly the motivation of, of, this, uh, of this project here, uh, where we have to study, uh, uh, to come up with uh, rheological laws. We have several approaches. So we have the, the geologist approach, uh, which is uh, working on structures in the field, uh, using uh, geophysics, petrology, and we can infer geometries, kinematics, pressure temperature conditions, ages, long terms, strain rates, and with time constants that are uh, very often over the million of years, and the approach of seismologists or geodesists with the time constants that are much shorter, of course. We have the, the approach of experimentalists here that can, who can measure rheological parameters, and the, the, but of course the lab, lab time is very short, it's a matter of weeks or months at the maximum. And we have also the uh, approach of modelers, numerical modelers that explore the, the space of parameters but have to uh, deal with highly simplified geometries and lithologies and usually use ad hoc rheological models. So what the, the aim of this project, the uh, ERC rheolith project here, is to try to reconcile those different approaches and uh, come up with uh, rheological models that are adapted to the various problems we are studying. So this project is based on uh, three uh, uh, main pillars. The first field work here, uh, we, we take some uh, shear zones that we, new ones or shear zones we have already studied here uh, to characterize the deformation, characterize strain gradients, estimate PT conditions, and, and dating. I'll come back to this uh, later on. We have the experimental part of, of the project with the uh, installation of a new great apparatus in, in Orléans here. And we have the modeling part of the, of the project, and especially uh, with changing scales from the very small scale scale of the uh, lab experiments all the way to the uh, uh, lithosphere, the scale of the lithosphere here to ensure, ensure a clean scale transfer. So, so far we have almost completed the field, uh, the field work. Okay, so most of the structures have been uh, studied. We have sampled uh, them and we have started the, the modeling. The experimental work will start this fall. So one of the questions we are, lead, we are uh, treating is this one. Can we measure the rate of strain localization with the, within those crustal scale shear zone? And the, the sampling strategy, strategy is this one. Uh, if we have a shear zone here uh, with several branches here with a major one in the middle, this would represent the finite strain uh, across the, the, those shear zone with smaller shear zone, less important shear zone and, and, and the bigger one. Uh, we sample this at different scale with different density of sampling, and we hope that these strain gradients will lead to age gradients with the, uh, using the argon-argon uh, methods on, on micas. Uh, this is a bit of a challenge because in some areas we know it works, and in other examples we know it doesn't work. So uh, uh, we, we, we'll see. So a, a few examples that we have started to study. Start with the Western Alps. Here we are here in the uh, external crystalline massif, especially the Pelvoux Oison massif here, uh, where Mathieu Belanger did his PhD. So this massif, it's a basement massif here, a variscent basement, that has been shortened during the alpine orogeny here, and uh, it results from the shortening of the former passive margin of, uh, of Europe here. And uh, the shortening is, is not uh, great, it's uh, something like uh, 30 percent, and uh, so one, one section of this, a new section of this, uh, shows that we have very strong deformation in the cover here, sedimentary cover, and we have the formation of new uh, compressional shear zone here, reverse shear zone in the basement. And those shear zones, they do not reactivate the former normal faults. They are oblique on them here, and they are localized by the presence of the former half grabbins here, and we have no reactivation of the former normal faults, and, and most of the deformation we have here is the... Uh, Alpine deformation. So just a few images here. Uh, you have uh, these shear zones, they crop out very well. And the features we see are typical of the brittle ductile transition. So not very hot uh, features, but with a very good uh, strain localization. Uh, at a smaller scale, we see very well the transformation of the initial rock here 
into what we call phylonites here, where the amount, the grain size, has considerably been reduced, and the amount of micas uh, has been reduced too. So we have worked on in situ argon argon ages on, on, the, on those micas here, and you see that the in, in situ ages they span a very large uh, time range, range from uh, variscan ages all the way to uh, late Oligocene or early Miocene ages. Okay. Clearly, these ages cannot be uh, alpine, they are clearly related to the variscan orogeny. Part of those ages are melange ages, and most of the ages we have are clearly alpine ages. If we zoom on, on this, you see that uh, the maximum of ages we have are some, somehow between somewhere between 30 and 25 MA uh, on, on those uh, various shear zones that crosses, cross the massif. Now the type of data we have on, on this area, uh, apart from the geometrical characterization of the area, is the uh, maximum temperature reached by the, uh, by, by the rocks. And you see that across the whole massif here, you have a constant temperature that's around uh, 330 degrees here. So the temperature increases further east, but across this massif here, temperature is very, uh, very stable, suggesting that there are no major displacement, vertical displacement uh, across the massif, and somehow that it behaves uh, rigidly before uh, this localization. And so we can come up with this story here with a in the beginning here, a more or less rigid subduction, where the maximum temperature was reached here, and then a progressive localization of strain within the subducting crust here, and afterward, a localization of the strain at the base of the massif and the formation of the present day thrust. And this is, occurs between, say, 33 million years all the way to 16 MA. So we, we have a rather good control on the velocity of uh, strain localization in, the, in this massif. Another example, very, very quickly, is it's Alpine Corsica, again, uh, which the, where in, in the uh, East End shear zone here we have nice strain localization. So uh, this is, these are all pictures, but you see the progressive increase of deformation across this shear zone. And uh, several years ago, we, we showed that uh, if you uh, date micas, from a distance from the shear zone to within the shear zone, you see clearly a, a reworking of old ages into young ages. So we think that we will be able to find age gradients here. So we have starting again to, to work, started again to work in that area and uh, to, to study the deformation of the, the Tenda Massif here. And um, uh, the shear zone, major shear zone here is, is here. But actually, within the whole massif, you have uh, oligomyosin deformation, and like, like here, for instance, in the western part of the, of the massif. So we, what we have done is try to uh, quantify, at least uh, uh, partly, the uh, uh, intensity of deformation, and all these colors here uh, in that area represent the intensity of deformation. Uh, we have uh, elaborated a scale with the type of structures we have uh, seen in the field, and you see that the maximum deformation is shown in the reddish color here, and the lower, uh, the least deformed part are in blue here. And you see that you have several shear zones here. Uh, and uh, in cross section, you have this. The major one is here, but you have others in the, in, in the more internal zone of the massif here with uh, uh, strain gradients. And at a smaller scale, you see the same thing here. And this is well in line with what we wanted to do uh, initially in, in the project. So we will. Uh, uh, work on, on this with ages. And we hope it works because when you separate the different micas, we study, you, you analyze different micas uh, here uh, uh, in, with respect to the uh, various deformation phases, you see that you can clearly separate uh, the different uh, generations of mica. Okay. So we think we'll be able to, to measure clearly this uh, strain gradient. Uh, another example, uh, quickly, uh, Aegean plutons and, and detachment here. Uh, you see all those plutons here. Uh, so I will just focus on, some, on one of them, them here on the island of Icaria, just to show you uh, these plutons here, this detachment here that's on, on Mykonos. But if we go on Icaria here, 
we have studied again the uh, geology of that area that was uh, poorly known. That's the new geological map we come up with. And the deformation is very consistent, uh, the stretch elimination, very consistent. We have uh, characterized new detachment systems here. And uh, using the same uh, methodology with uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, scale of uh, uh, strain facies here from undeformed rocks to ultramyelonites, we are able to map the deformation here. And you see that the gradient is very characteristic toward the detachment here. And so we have this shear zone here. And uh, you, you have very poorly deformed rocks here all the way to highly strained rocks here. So we also hope to have uh, the real uh, rocks, good rocks for what we want to do. Uh, because if you analyze the micas here, uh, you see a very nice difference between the, these are in uh, Muscovite bearing granite at the beginning. You see the uh, magmatic mica here, and you see clearly that the, uh, along the shear bands you have different micas here, smaller grain and different micas with different composition. So we hope that we'll be able to characterize the several generations of micas during the deformation. Okay. So um, I'm running late, I think. So uh, just to, uh, how long time? Okay. Just to uh, change scale, uh, to show you what we are, what we are doing. Uh, oh, it's, not a, it's a bit too much. <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Okay, so to go to the large scale, uh, some uh, nice numerical model that uh, Pietro Sterna is in the room somewhere, uh, has done in our, our team, uh, working with uh, uh, Talas Garia's code here. Uh, what, what about uh, slab behavior, depth, and strain localization in the, in the upper plate with the example of the, of the uh, Aegean area. But this area is known for uh, 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 very good relations between uh, slab retreat and upper plate deformation and the formation of uh, uh, metamorphic core complexes. These, these are 2D reconstructions we published with Jean-Pierre Brun uh, some years ago. And we also have this uh, a very typical pattern of uh, counterclockwise rotation here along the North Anatolian faults, almost rigid rotation of Anatolia here, and uh, acceleration of the velocity here in, in, in the Aegean Sea with extension uh, active at present. We also have uh, evidence of uh, uh, slab tearing with one quite obvious tear here that's been active since uh, about 17 million years here and probably one more recent one here, uh, much more recent, around five, five million years. And we have this piece of, uh, of uh, oceanic lithosphere, partly, well, mantle lithosphere, uh, retreating toward the south between those two tiers. And, um, so that's a view of a simplified view of this with a big tear here and a more recent tear here. Uh, so if we, if we study the, um, just show you the uh, numerical models. So this, this is the, uh, the setup uh, designed by, by Pietro. You have um, here the uh, overriding plate, a bit of continent here, and a larger continent de there, and the rest is oceanic plate. And the, um, what, what goes on is like, we have, uh, you see here the, the mantle, uh, the model has been stripped, you see the mantle. You have a first a retreat on this side here, and then the second, the western part, if you put the, the north on the right here, the western part is much faster than the eastern part here, and, and you have this fast lab retreat in, in, that, in that area. And what comes up is uh, if you look at the, uh, from, from the top, you will see uh, this uh, in the second part of the uh, evolution, where the, the, above the retreating uh, slab here, you have this uh, counterclockwise rotation of the material that is retreating fast. You see that the vectors here are, far, are larger than uh, those ones here. So you have clearly uh, extensional deformation in the middle here, and you see clearly the distinct 
um, uh, strike slip fault here that is very similar to the uh, North Anatolian fault. And here, if you compare to the, uh, uh, the uh, I should have put the references so here, this is from Perus and, and others. You see the strain localization deduced from the GPS data along the uh, North Anatolian fault and of course along the subduction zone here. And you see the, the, the comparison between the, the, two, the two systems. So it seems that the, uh, uh, it's possible to argue that uh, the strain localization here, the formation of the North Anatolian fault, is uh, a consequence of slab retreat, as was put forward uh, uh, some years ago by, by Claudio and others, and, uh, and not only a consequence of the collision here. So we, we see the, the interaction between very deep mantle processes and crustal deformation uh, very clearly. So um, as uh, uh, conclusions, uh, uh, very prelimin preliminary conclusions, uh, the major ingredients of strain localization in, in the continental uh, crust, at least, is, uh, is that uh, cross mantle, lithospheric, lithosphere, asthenosphere interactions are a uh, major ingredient, that crustal heterogeneity is a major ingredient as well, and that the small scale processes like fluids, grain size, reduction, so on, they will enhance localization, but they are not at the origin of uh, strain localization. Thank you. So one, one problem that I've always had with experimental rheological measurements, right, is that the strain rates, so time scales are short, so the strain rates are enormously different yes. than the Earth because they're enormously large, right? And there's the possibility that you activate at some point a mechanism for deformation that we don't know about and that it's impossible to do with modeling because if you don't know it exists, you, you won't model it. And so to me, that connection between the experimental rheology and what we use in convection or tectonic, thermal tectonic, it's really at the heart of, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that, that, that was one of the uh, uh, first order motivation of the project, that uh, when, when we talk with uh, Evgeny Burov, who is one of the co-leaders of the project, uh, we always have faced this problem that he has to, uh, to use ad hoc uh, rheologies like mo most modelers and, and very often, sometimes uh, uh, rheological parameters derived from lab experiments, they work, uh, sometimes they don't and, and so you, you, you have to adapt your rheological parameters. And, but you have to cope with this, the, I mean, in a lifetime would not be enough to deform rocks with the natural strain rates. So e either... Yes, that's, that, that's one, yeah. The problem in the field is that you have problems to quantify uh, strain rates. That's why, why we want to, uh, to do it with uh, uh, those uh, argon, argon ages. We hope to come up with some, something. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Uh, or you, you work on a lab laboratory experiment and numerical modeling, and you, you, you try to model the lab, lab experiment with the numerical models and try to see how you can, uh, you, 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 you can uh, uh, increase or decrease the strain rate and to see whether it fits or not. And that's, that's the, core of the, the core of the project. We have not reached that stage yet. But. Um, so do you, do you uh, run an idea, like an approximate idea of what is the rate for example, of the velocity of motion of the North Cyclade detachment zone. Kind of number. One millimeter, one centimeter. You mean the North Cyclade yeah. detachment system? Like I, I would say one, centi one, one centimeter. I would compare it with the Gulf of Corinth. So uh, between 0 0.5 and 1.5 centimeter per year on the whole, on the whole st structure. But this, this, this is more like a guess than Else. We, we don't really have so far the. Uh, when you reconstruct the evolution of the Aegean, you, you, you see that the, the overall extension rate across the Aegean is approximately, during the Miocene, is about the same as not we see nowadays. So it does not change much uh, through time, e even after the North Anatolian Fault was, 
uh, it propagated in the system. So the order of magnitude is about the same. How much is precisely localized on, on the North Cycladic detachment system? It's difficult to say, but uh, something like a centimeter is, is fine, I think. Okay. Uh, there is no other uh, comment? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. Okay. Uh, which the, the timing you mean? Yeah, you get two months and then you get something else and you say this is working and this is better and this is better. Ah, you, you, this picture with the, the folds yeah. and so on. Yeah. Well, you, you just, uh, uh, just to feel the appearance, you, you, you see the folds, they are cut by, uh, by shear bands and, and then uh, the whole stuff is cut by the fold. So it's, it's a very, very fine. Yeah. yeah. 